well, um, to get into that, let's uh, say a little bit how it came about. Sure. The, uh, after we left the moon and started home, uh, and as I said, my responsibilities were largely completed at that point. We no longer had the lunar spacecraft that had been crashed into the moon for a seismic experiment to ring the seism seismometers on Apollos uh, 11, 12, and 14 uh, with, to uh, get deep seismic data from inside the moon. And our, so our mission was complete and we were headed home and I could relax a little bit. So I got the opportunity to look out the window and we were oriented and rotating such that uh, every two minutes, and this rotation was to keep thermal balance on the spacecraft. Uh, so every two minutes, the, the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, and a 360 degree panorama of the heavens came into the spacecraft window. And that's really a powerful experience because looking at the heavens from that perspective, uh, they're 10 times as bright and 10 times as many stars as you can ever see from Earth. So it's an overwhelming experience. And I had the, uh, as I looked at this, from my studies of astronomy at Harvard and MIT, where I studied astronomy to get my doctorate, <clears throat> I realized that the molecules of my body and the molecules in the spacecraft and my partner's bodies have been prototyped and perhaps manufactured in some ancient generation of stars. And suddenly that was very personal. Instead of being an intellectual knowledge, those were my molecules. And uh, it was a visceral experience, an overwhelmingly powerful visceral experience and accompanied by a bliss and ecstasy. And I never had that type of experience before. And uh, that, that's another story, we can talk about that later. But uh, what it made me realize is that since we were the, the first generation of, space, of spacefarers from Earth, that and humans forever had been asking the deep questions about who are we, how do we get here, what's our relationship to the cosmos, uh, and I realized that our story of ourselves as told by science was likely incomplete and perhaps flawed, and the story of ourselves as told by our cultural traditions, normally rooted in religion, were archaic and perhaps flawed. And maybe we as the first generation of spacefarers probably needed to be thinking about these deep questions all over again from a new point of view. And that was the, what was going through my mind. And uh, as I thought about that, and after the fact, after the flight, and uh, started to understand this experience that happened in space, I realized that <clears throat> What we were dealing with was the nature of consciousness. Why are we conscious? And of course, being trained in the sciences and in technologies, I quickly realized that studies of consciousness and mind uh, had not been a part of science for the last 400 years, since the time of Rene Descartes and Newton, when uh, Descartes postulated that body, mind, physicality, spirituality, belong to different realms of reality. Now that served the noble purpose of getting uh, the inquisition of the period of the, of the Roman church off the backs of the intellectuals in Europe and so that science as we understand it, classical Newtonian science, arose as long as they stayed away from mind, consciousness and such things that were considered realm of the church. And we have labored under that for 400 years with science as a materialist science, uh, but without at all asking the deep question in science, what's mind and consciousness all about? And I realized that it was time to change that. And that was the beginning of my idea for the Institute of Noetic, Sci Noetic Sciences, which uh, I've now spent uh, 36 years building up. What I learned as I did research on what is the nature of this experience I had in space, I um, had to appeal to some anthropologists that did some research for me into ancient thought systems and ancient cultures and came up with uh, uh, 
understanding from the ancient Sanskrit language, uh, the concept of salvakapa samadhi. And, uh, and I ask, what is that? Well, that is a state of mind in which you see things in their separateness, but ex experience them viscerally as a unity, as a oneness, and accompanied by ecstasy and bliss. And I said, well, that's exactly what I felt in space. And the more I dug into that concept and talked with uh, uh, leadership in different cultures, the mystics, uh, spiritual leaders in different religions and different cultures, I came to realize that that type of experience is the basis of all religion. It's a transcend, transcendental, transformational, transcendent experience, which catapults you out of the normal ego ways of thinking. And uh, it's the basis of all religion. But in the uh, religions are culturally oriented. And uh, as time has gone on in the past, even though the ancients had this type of experience, uh, unless you've had that type of experience, you get pulled away into uh, politics, economics, and other such things, that, uh, and the central message gets lost. So my notion in consciousness studies was to bring this idea and understand it and use the tools of science to help understand these types of uh, consciousness experiences. Uh, over the years, the answer is yes, we've talked about it. However, um, it's such a personal, private experience. And you, like, like religion, you bring to that experience what you have learned in the rest of your life. And all of the astronauts that have been to the moon have had some type, similar type experience. And a book's been written about it by the, by the uh, uh, trying, trying, I can't remember the author at the moment, uh, but it's called The Overview Effect. And uh, all, it, it really is a description of, from the interviews from quite a number of us who have seen Earth from space and what I call the big picture effect. He called it the over, overview effect. And it's this notion of, of, of wonder and awe at seeing the universe and seeing life on Earth from that point of view. And uh, we've all had something similar to what I just described.